Good evening and welcome to the American Islamic College Lecture Series Program. Thank you all so much for being here with us. We're honored that we have today with us Dr. Rami Nashashidi. He is the director, uh, executive director of the Inner City Muslim Action Network, also known as Iman, and Sentence Corporation as a nonprofit in 1997. He has a PhD in sociology from the University of Chicago. He has worked with several leading scholars in the area of globalization, African American studies, and urban sociology. Rami has lectured across the United States, Europe, and Asia on a range of topics related to American Muslim identity, community activism, and social justice issues, and is a recipient of several prestigious community service and organizing honors. Rami has his work with Iman, has been featured on many national and international media outlets, including the BBC, PBS, and a front page story in the Chicago Tribune. Chicago Public Radio has selected Rami Nashashibi as one of the city's top 10 Chicago global visionaries. Rami was named one of the 500 most influential Muslims in the world by the Royal Islamic Strategic Studies Center in concert with Georgetown's Prince Al Walid bin Talal Center for Muslim Christian Understanding. He was named a White House Champion of Change in 2011 and was also invited by the Governor of Illinois to serve on the Commission of, for the Elimination of Poverty and as a member of the Governor's Muslim Advisory Council. Dr. Nashashidi is Assistant Professor of Sociology, Religion, and Muslim Studies at Chicago Theological Seminary. He'll be working with a cohort of Muslim, Jewish, and Christian students at the vital intersections of theological education, sustainability, interreligious engagement, and social justice. He's now with us here today to talk about the sociology of Sira, reclaiming prophetic tradition for our time and place. Dr. Rami. Dear beloved brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum, peace and blessings be upon you. Uh, it's an extraordinary honor, privilege to be uh, at the American Islamic College and uh, very inspired by uh, the this small documentary and uh, by all the extraordinary work that uh, I see happening here with many uh, familiar faces, um, distinguished scholars and activists, many of whom I'm very embarrassed to even speak in front of because they've had such a uh, tremendous influence on my life. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge a couple of them, but first I'd like to again thank Sheikh Ali, uh, his tenacity, his persistence, and continuing to fight to make this center uh, and Islamic American College a, uh, a vision, a reality that can be a source of inspiration for Muslims and others here in Chicago and across the world. I'd like to recognize and also give it up to the AIC today for the extraordinary news of additional accreditation for some of the degree program. We give it up for Sheikh Ali and all the phenomenal work. As I mentioned, uh, many here are uh, familiar faces, and so tonight I'm much more interested, quite frankly, in a conversation than any uh, lecture, although I'll try to present some thoughts and uh, abridge them so that we can engage in a more lively, robust conversation. I should say that, you know, uh, I am a product of this city in many ways, um, and although I've been privileged with a upbringing that kind of has had me across the world, and in many ways I'm a, a nomadic in that way, but Chicago, I'm, I'm at this point in my life very deeply rooted, and uh, many people in the city have had a profound uh, influence on me when I, in many ways, was just a wayward, uh, uh, directionless, uh, but very kind of, uh, uh, you know, enthusiastic and eager uh, seeker of sorts, and uh, one of those individuals kind of stopped me in my tracks, slapped me upside my head a couple of times, and tried to uh, redirect some of my uh, 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 erratic energy is uh, Dr. Alvin McLeod, who's uh, sitting here, uh, a mother of sorts in many ways uh, to, I'm sure, many in this in the audience, but she uh, really has had and continues to have a very uh, deep influence on my life. So I want to acknowledge Dr. McLeod uh, for being here today. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to launch into a conversation about uh, the sociology of Sira. 
uh, and kind of maybe start with this idea of the title and uh, the kind of the notion of reclaiming prophetic tradition for our time and place. The, the title in many ways is coming out of what I'm beta testing at Chicago Theological Seminary, a course that uh, will be called the Sociology Sira, surveying the writings on Muhammad, Sallallahu uh, Alaihi and in that context and over the semester at CTS, my objective over the course is to really engage the multiple writings uh, on the Prophet life through the lens of kind of a sociological inquiry. Uh, there's extraordinary scholarship that's being uh, that's coming out uh, across the country now, particularly a young cohort of scholars that are doing this type of work um, and allowing us to begin to think about not only the narratives about the Prophet but how those narratives get uh, uh, interpreted through various lens uh, and what those implications for the way in which we engage, contextualize, internalize the narrative uh, and this of, uh, of the profound story that continues to have so much impact on us. But for tonight, I want to think about the uh, lecture a little differently. Starting off though with this idea about what we mean when we think about the sociology of Sira. Um, so to break that down for a moment, I want to look at the sociology uh, of the tradition through a context that goes beyond in sociology what we often talk about is kind of the sociology of religion framework. Uh, initially framed for us by uh, kind of forefathers in the, in the tradition of people like Weber and, and Durkheim who in the 19th century started thinking about again the impact uh, of religious thought, religious formation on critical develop societal developmental things such as of course the formation of capitalism and you know we think of Weber's famous work uh, you know, uh, the Protestant work ethic and its intersection <coughs> with capitalism and what, uh, you know, religious formation and institutions have done to help usher in a particular new age of capitalist frameworks that uh, continue to stick with us to the modern day. Durkheim was well known for thinking about methodologies that allowed us to think about things as even uh, notions of suicide, his famous studies of suicide and what various religious, uh, particularly fault lines between Catholic and Protestant <coughs> ethics and values, how those ideas had impact on something as consequential as who takes their life, right? A very important sociological question. But I want to suggest that in, in the context of thinking about this when we talk about Sila, what does that mean for me? I want to posit that, you know, the, this idea uh, that the societal context really always mattered in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu You know, when we look at um, this notion of sociology and social context, uh, there are now many writings on his life and more contemporary engagements of his sira that allow us to think about those particular moments in light of some of the social issues of our time. But I would continue to suggest that we need to uh, probe those inquiries even further and produce a much more robust, accessible dialogue around those issues. Um, you know, we can't go through the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam without confronting moments in which social context matters. And as, um, as intuitive as that may be, as sensible as that may be, and obvious, it's worth pointing out. Because oftentimes, we don't think about both the Prophet's injunctions, and the multiple realities in which he was navigating, and how they were both informed by the social context, and then, of course, help inform the social context. Examples. Um, and, and I would suggest that those examples, as we go into a couple of them, are pregnant with possibilities for how we think about Islam in the modern age. And I would also suggest that they're imperative for us to mine for many of the issues, challenges, problems, that we, and possibilities that uh, continues to both confront uh, Muslims here and across the world. You know, you know, examples that many of us are familiar with, the, the story of the Bedouin walking into the masjid of the Prophet said them, Famous uh, story, of course, uh, partly, you know, this man comes in while he's sitting with the companions, while the Prophet is sitting with the companions, 
and has the audacity to urinate in the corner of the Prophet Sallallahu Masjid. Now, this story gets related to us by many, for, for many reasons, but uh, I just find it extraordinarily intriguing for the kind of his reaction. Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi of course, um, responds to his companions who are uh, absolutely aghast with horror of what's happening before them that in the sacred space of the masjid and in the sacred presence of our beloved Prophet a man has the audacity to do something as, as, uh, uh, as disrespectful as actually urinate in his presence and urinate in the corner and so they rush to accost this man of course the Prophet uh, not only cautions them and prevents them from doing that, but uh, instructs them to actually clean the urine of the man that they were about to uh, confront physically. Uh, and then in the interaction with those individuals, with the companions, begins to talk about, of course, one of the lessons in the story is the background of this man. In other words, He's a Bedouin. He's coming from a, a particular social context, a social reality that you don't have an awareness of, clearly. And that that social context matters in how you engage him, how you interact him. There are multiple lessons here, including, again, checking that almost gangster-like tendency, right? that was even forming around the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi to say, how dare you insult the Prophet of God in our presence, right? And so, of course, this humbling tendency for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi to actually, in this kind of the, the, uh, the, the primacy that he is placing on khidmah, service, consistently, even in the face of something as uh, as, uh, as a moment as this one, to actually challenge his companions to go clean the very urine of the man that they were about to accost. And then to humble themselves with the recognition that they know nothing about him. They know nothing about his social context. And they, and, or if they had known anything about their social context, they had not factored in those variables, right? What we talk about in sociology is sociological variables about how then their actions should be informed by that recognition. So, in many ways, again, the contention that the Prophet was not only alerting his companions to these types of realities, but he himself navigating the complexity of 7th century social uh, uh, of Arabia, which one could suggest in light of our time pales in comparison in terms of social complexity. But the idea that the Prophet is navigating that in many of his interactions. And again, so we think about that, we think about you know, the implications, the social implications of, you know, the interactions with, and the multiple stories and points of contact with someone like Abdullah ibn Maktoum, right? The companion, the blind companion, that the Prophet uh, of course, Surah Abbasawatawalla is the source of, is the occasion of revelation, is, the, uh, is revealed in the occasion of his interaction with Abdullah ibn Maktoum when he is approaching the Prophet and talking to him about Islam. And of course, at that time, the Prophet is distracted by some of the more uh, senior ranking chiefs of the uh, uh, Meccan society. And in the most, and of course our scholars, which I'm not, you know, could tell us about the very delicate way in which we talk about those moments in the Qur'an where the Prophet ﷺ is, uh, admonished may be a hard word, but engaged in this, in this extraordinarily uh, interesting, intriguing manner that in and of itself is a very uh, uh, compelling proof of the uniqueness of the Qur'an which if, 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 and this is a somewhat of a parenthetical point, the Quran is filled with several moments like this where the Prophet is actually engaged with the divine and in some cases corrected by the divine. Uh, and uh, this is, a, I think, a really fascinating part of the text. Again, pregnant with possibilities when we start thinking about the implications of an individual like Abdullah ibn Maktoum. And when we start thinking about social dynamics of issues of people with special needs in our own society, here's a man 
with, ex with special needs, who's engaged with the Prophet who later ends up being appointed by the Prophet of God to, appoint, to lead prayer, right, to this, this extraordinary station, this leadership in his society, and would always go up to, to address Abdullah ibn Maktoum as the man that Allah revealed these number of verses for, uh, and reprimanded, chastised, corrected me about. And again, all of the other social dynamics of what that means to think about addressing those in society that sometimes are maybe the most eager to embrace a message, the most eager to give their life for a message, but sometimes not necessarily having all the social rank. It also speaks to the humanity of the, the story of our prophet, peace be upon him, who of course had to navigate power relationships, right? Uh, again, one could contend that the complexity of power relationships in 7th century Arabia pale in comparison to the complexity of 21st century interconnected global world that we live in. Yet, if the principle that the Prophet himself was alive to that reality, then how would he be alive to, how do we think about those principles in our modern day and time? Of course, underlying all of this for uh, the scholars to help us understand is the broader overarching science that this is not only a prophetic precedent, right? This is, in other words, this is not these moments of meaningful societal intervention in the stickiness, the messiness, right? And in some cases, very parochial affairs of 7th century Arabia is not only about the sunnah of our prophets, some of lives to them, but our scholars remind us that this is actually the sunnah of Allah's revelation. In other words, Allah's Qur'an re revelation, and this again is coming to speak both to the universal and particularities of those moments and help to extract universal meaning from the very particular stickiness, messiness of a social moment. Demanding some sophisticated social analysis of that moment. That, yes, our scholars have an extraordinary role and we have 1400 years of examining that, but in light of also our modern day and time, I would suggest we need to also, with the tools of our tradition and with the tools of modern social science and with the tools, uh, insights of the modern world, begin to more effectively think about those moments in the context of the life of our beloved Prophet All the moments, again, the multiple moments in the life of the Prophet and you, 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 you just continue to encounter these. You know, he was not monolithic. He was not static. The seerah was not static in any way. It had social messiness, as I'm calling it. Complexities. And in some cases, the Prophet responded almost categorically different in one uh, situation than he would to another situation. So if, if someone was grabbing him by, uh, and, and moments where you literally have moments in the seerah where the prophet of God is being grabbed by his neck collar, right? And yelled at and said, Al-Sini, Ya Rasulullah, give me advice. Oh, prophet of God, the very famous interaction with one of the companions who's clearly in a state of anger at that moment, and the Prophet's response, La tabda, don't be angry. Awsini, Ya Rasulullah, clearly not getting the point. La tabda. Awsini, that's not the advice I want. Right? La tabda, don't be angry. Right? Again, many of our scholars are, have been, you know, may Allah continue to preserve it, all of them and, and allow us to be uh, worthy recipients of all of their, uh, of their fruits over the years and institutions like this one to open up us to the meanings of all these. But I would like to also again suggest that aside from all of those things is just the extraordinary moment that you, here you have a person in supreme authority, right? interfacing and interacting with members of his community in ways that, again, are by no means static. There were certain companions that, of course, would never dare interact with the Prophet in that way. And the Prophet probably would never have allowed to interact with him that way because there was more expectation. But to have people who have, you know, have moments in the life biography of this 
you know, extraordinary human being, may the, the peace and blessings be upon him, it's, it's, it's again, rich with possibilities of social implications of what that means in a society of when we're talking about, again, frames of authority. Not just authoritative individuals, but authoritative, uh, authoritative narratives, right? We, and I'll, I'll talk about this a little more, we, I would suggest that part of what is challenging the Muslim world today, both here in America and across the globe, is the hegemonic authority of these narratives. And that they've been persistent. And that in spite of some development, that they're still there. And there's a, and there's a, and there's a extraordinary anxiety when we attempt to engage or question them. And in some parts of the world, and unfortunately, in parts of the world that are purporting to be now the epicenter of the tradition, right? doing so is at the cost of your life. So, and we'll talk about that more in a second. So we take that as yet another moment, and then again, maybe another before we move on, another set of examples around the issue of the significance of gender disparities and issues of gender notions. You know, we, that continues to be a discourse in our community that is extraordinarily important. Whether we're talking about issues, you know, there are often, there's lots of angst when Muslims are trying to talk you know, anchored in tradition about LGBT issues and the discourse around sexualities in, in, the, in, our, in our modern society. And how do we navigate those types of questions alongside other issues of hypersexuality across the globe, right? These are, these are real conversations. And what's really interesting to think about, again, in the context of the Prophet Sallallahu time, we know there were moments where women, right, came to the Prophet and directly asked them very straightforward questions about sexuality. That in this day and age, you know, again, the lack of a forum to be able to engage quote-unquote authoritative figures in ways about issues and real needs, sexual needs for women. I mean, that would be considered a taboo subject, right? But to hear, to be having a very open and honest conversation with the Prophet Sallallahu about those types of things, right? The spectrum of sexuality that continues to be issues in our community. Can the Muslims, can our Muslim community prove that we can be, again, uh, as straightforward in the types of conversations that we're having that for 7th century Arabia were certainly progressive, uh, but still anchored in a tradition that was about connecting to the divine. Can we model that in the modern age? Or are we, in, are, are we stuck between a schizophrenic uh, world in which those who, again, present themselves as the, pure, uh, the purest reservoirs of how to understand Islamic sexuality are engaged in mass rape, right? And find ways of sanctioning that within their, within their uh, twisted interpretation of Sharia and the Prophet's life, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, while, you know, uh, Muslims who are struggling to preserve some sanctity of who they are in the context of the West are made to feel less than human because they continue to struggle with really basic questions of how to make connections uh, across some of the very sticky and some messy issues of our social realities. It's not simply about the sexuality issues but just simply the voice of women and leadership that not just took the form and the time of being able to engage the Prophet Sallallahu around those questions, but moments, of course, that even the Khulifa Rashidun immediately after the time of the Prophet Sallallahu were able to preserve institutional moments. I mean, you literally have moments in the middle of a khutbah where a woman is getting up and correcting Umar radiallahu anhu in the middle of a khutbah. Can we imagine scenarios, right? In 21st century Chicago, we still have masajid where women are not allowed into, let alone be able to engage, confront, and correct their authorities. So we, we need to begin to probe some of those moments and explore, again, the social implications of them for our, 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 our moment. So, again, 
and I'll end with this, and I've mentioned this before, and I think this is a moving moment for me when, you know, the, the Prophet ﷺ, when we look at his, when we, so when we talk about sociology of sirah, in, many, in, in one way what I mean is that the social context of the sirah mattered, and this is nothing new for scholarly insight, because this has helped to animate the tradition for 1400 years in thinking about this, but what I would suggest is that we still are very anemic in thinking about how to apply that for our modern times. And so as robust as our tradition has been, I think we still come up short in you know, being uh, dynamic, inspiring interlocutors with the, the issues that we're confronting in our modern day and age. So we often sound like the most you know, regressive voice in the room. Or oftentimes the most silent voice because we have very little to contribute, not only to the discussion, but to the actual uh, issue that people are, com are are confronting, but again, I so one is the social context. The other thing is that the Prophet ﷺ himself continued, as in the moments with the Bedouin, deploy sociological insights in the way in which he navigated society and enjoined his companions to do the same. Look, when you take a moment, a very famous moment, when the, you take a companion like Ma'ad ibn Jabit, when he's being sent to Yemen, and among, he's being given a list of things to do and not do as he goes into this land at the time where there are no Muslims to talk about, to propagate, and to engage conversations about connecting people to the oneness of the divine. And among the things he says, right, one of the most famous things is about the dua of the madhloom, right? The invocation of the oppressed. Right? It's this statement that fear, be mindful of the invocation of the oppressed, because between his or her invocation and God, there is no curtain. Right? Very important advice for multiple reasons. And of course, it's important because, among other things, the Prophet doesn't delineate the Madhloom among the Christians, among the Muslims, the Jews. It's just Madhloom, it's just oppressed. It's this idea that the oppressed themselves have a higher station and a more direct connection to the divine. So it's a powerful, spiritual, spiritually agitational concept. But another important point here is that it also demands that Muhammad deploy the sciences of sociology. Right? In other words, if you're going into Yemen, right? If you are to be mindful of the dua of the oppressed, that means you have to be able to be mindful of oppression. Right? Think about where it exists in that society. Be able to point it out. Be mindful of it. Be attuned to it. And for me, I love this story because thinking about Mu'ad and what happens later in his life helps to close the loop. Right? Much later in his life, Mu'ad is sent to Rome. And there's this very famous moment where he's coming to give uh, the message, if you will, to the very arrogant Roman you know, emperor who is anticipating this man coming out of the desert, smelling of camel dung, right? And so in order to overwhelm them with the majesty of the Roman court, he instructs his... Uh, followers to deck out the Roman court and to create this extraordinarily rich embroidered medjlis, this place, this seat, this throne of, of sorts that Ma'ad would sit on and then engage in conversation with the emperor. So as Ma'ad comes into the court, he looks around and then walks straight to the emperor. He clearly sees what was intended for him to sit on, he studies it for a moment, and what does he do? You know, some of you know the story? He sits on the floor. Roman emperor is incensed. Right? Uh, how dare you come out of a backward, God-forsaken desert and insult the majesty of the Roman court? Right? And Ma'ai then responds, do you think Right? I'm going to sit on something right, that was made off the oppression, the blood, the back, the sweat of your oppressed peoples. Right? 
So the very ability at that moment to take the advice of the Prophet ﷺ many years later into the way in which he reads the social reality of a foreign land, a land that the Muslims are about to go to war with, right? Or on the verge of war with, but still being attuned and attentive to the dynamic layers of, again, oppression, socioeconomic stratification, we would call it in 20th century or 21st century sociology, but attuned to those things. And that those things mattered. And they informed the way in which the companions navigated. So, so that's one multiple meanings of why I think, again, inserting a sociological framework and thinking about Sira is not just, it's not, to, it's not in any way, shape, or form to diminish the extraordinary scholarship that is already there. But it's, we need to continue to renew that tradition. And again, challenge thinkers in our modern age to, to begin to, to re-examine some of the multiple implications for our times. Secondly, here's the second meaning. And this is a little bit more in keeping with what I think what you hear in kind of modern sociological parlance. When we talk about race, and I know this analogy is dangerous, right? So hear me out. When we talk about race, is race real? Now, it's a loaded question. <laughs> I have another sheikh who's in attendance here, so I want uh, Sheikh Masbahdeen, mashallah, very important person, was introduced to me by Dr. McLeod. He's nodding his head. And of course, on some level, the, those who would simply answer no would say, of course, that race is a social construct of the 19th and 18th century and has various genealogies that connect to both religious and pseudo-scientific eugenics of uh, early 20th century uh, discourse, both here in Europe. The idea that there is this racially constructed thing called race uh, is clearly a construct on some very real levels. And we don't need to go far into the deep sciences to make that argument. All you need to do is go back into history in a city like Chicago. In 1930, 1940, right, to visit a neighborhood like the one that I work and live in right now on the southwest side of Chicago, uh, that neighborhood and in a neighborhood like Bridgeport, particularly in the 19, even, partic even earlier on, you would call Bridgeport what? What type of neighborhood would Bridgeport have been? An Irish neighborhood. Market Park would probably be in a, a Lithuanian neighborhood, right? Near West Side would have been an Italian neighborhood. Right? These kind of ethnic social cons, these kind of ethnic uh, identifications. Uh, again, there's a vast literature now about the sociological construction of race and what were the variables that helped precipitate the formation and consolidation of whiteness as we know it in America, right? As Bridgeport becomes a white neighborhood, Market Park then becomes a white neighborhood, but there are many factors that lead to that. First and foremost, again, the larger narratives of what are consolidating around the nation state narrative of America at that time. Remember, immigration now was shut in 1924, and we're beginning to have these communities settle, but then you have this thing called the Great Migration and uh, infusion of African Americans that begin to come alongside these poor, working class, working poor neighborhoods across south and west side of Chicago to begin to create, in many ways, whiteness does not become a category without the extraordinary presence of African Americans and the inclusion that white Irish and Lithuanians are aspiring towards to be part of the nation, right? And now you can see this in terms of number of very rich, rich studies and some of our problems that clearly continue to be with us today. Uh, and we'll talk a little more about implications of Ferguson. But the realities of race as a social construct, what I'd like to also think about, while some will say it's a social construct, others will clearly say and have every sociological right to say as people like Dr. Jackson, of course, and others, our scholars in our own community will assert, race is very real. 
although it's a social construct, it's a construct that now has had profound implications in the way where we live, where we go to school, who we marry, uh, our whole uh, national identity, our narrative. So it, it, there's, there's no going back and saying somehow that racial identities, you know, simply because, yes, they were socially constructed, they were very real and have real implications. What does that have to do with Sira? Or this, uh, when we begin to think about the implications of Sira? Again, I want to suggest that uh, the modern understanding of Sira is as much a social construct in many ways as anything else. In other words, the Sunnah, right? That, that, that nomenclature of I'm on the Sunnah, right? She's on the Sunnah. That is a particular construct informed by our interpretations, engagements with various modern movements, notions and things that have translocated themselves from different parts of the world, found themselves in places like neighborhoods like Philly, you have a couple of Philly natives. So the Sunnah in the 1990s in Philly, West Philly, South Philly, it, you know, is, is not some notion of what's it's, you know, although those who are kicking that terminology would like to suggest that it is a pure uh, and much more uncomplicated uh, reference to 7th century early prophetic sunnah, the Prophet ﷺ didn't wear Timberlands, right? He wasn't rocking a Benny Siegel or a freeway beater, right? <laughs> so it was, it was very much a sunnah that gets recontextualized, socially constructed in the context of a kind of urban, gritty environment of South and West Philly that is now responding to the presence of Muslims who are now coming en masse post-1965, mixing with kind of more indigenous Muslims, presenting a more authentic engagement, but still allowing for some street cred. Whole bunch of messy variables at work, from hip hop to street culture to international stuff. But it's a social construct that produces what in South Philly in West Philly now is talked about as Sunnah, right? And so that is one side of the spectrum. So is the number of Sunday schools that proliferate across the, the America post-1965 that begin to, again, think about the Sira and the Sunnah in a particular context, oftentimes, you know, with a standard set of stories, a standard set of imagery, oftentimes framed in a particular way that make us relate to the Sunnah as an authority and the Sira in a particular narrative that um, of course is filtered through a whole number of social variables. But not unlike Dr. Jackson's notion of a false universal, right? When you don't recognize the socially constructed nature of things, the danger is to falsely ascribe some transcendent universal value. And it's tricky when we talk about the Sira because we do indeed believe that prophetic example, and I'll talk about this in a sec, is transcendent, is in many ways universally applicable. But to suggest that those understandings and interpretations of things that have cultural filters have not been, are not at work now and have not been at work in for, for 13, 1400 years is very problematic when you begin to think about the way in which communities relate to the sunnah or the sira of our Prophet So I want to suggest that again, the title, I haven't gone beyond the title so far, but that the title, the idea of Sociology of Sira is also to think about those moments of social construction that have real life implications for us today, for Muslims here and across the globe. Now, I want to be true to my promise to abridge the, the lecture so that we can have time for conversation. I want to get to the other part of the, the title, which is the idea of reclaiming prophetic tradition for our time and place. Now that, unlike the course, of course, is just meant for a very open, honest lecture and conversation here at AIC. The idea of reclamation suggests, the need for reclamation suggests that something has been co-opted or hijacked, right? So let me be honest, and I don't think, you know, we're, I don't anticipate much disagreement in this room, 
that the Islam and particularly the appropriation and understanding of Sira has been hijacked, has been appropriated, co-opted in many ways by two very diametrically opposed but equally problematic sides of the spectrum. On one side of the spectrum and everything in between, quite frankly, but on one side of the spectrum, we have a, a new set of iterations of very old arguments against the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. Anyone that writes about or engages Sira literature will look at many of the age-old polemics directed against him, many of whom are not new, and some even existed during the time of his you know, 7th century Arabia. But the fact that there is now a multi-million dollar, if not multi-billion dollar industry, both in this country and across the globe, um, that's invested in this project is of consequence for us. Having said that, whether those people are directly connected, and I don't want to be conspiratorial here, just stating the fact that there are people that are monetarily invested in the project. I think that's indisputable, but also, you know, we have to recognize that this is no longer as, as the, uh, as the, uh, uh, who's the CNN anchor, Maher, Bill, Bill, Ma Bill Maher, right, uh, exemplified most recently. This is no longer a discourse uh, that is confined to the other spectrum of right-wing uh, kind of Tea Party-like conservatives that across the political spectrum People who are historically doing what they have done, questioning, attempting to deconstruct some of the very integral principles of Islam through direct engagements with the life story of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, particularly because for Muslims and for so many, the two are very intertwined. You can't talk about Qur'an without talking about the implementation, without talking about the Prophet's life. So, I'm so if one way, and again, reproducing many historical arguments with a new modern flair. So we have this group that is not only co-opting, hijacking, but framing the narrative, attempting to frame the national discourse on websites, now on campuses and across the country. We need to take that threat very seriously to the both social, psychological, and I would suggest physical well-being of our communities. On the other side of the spectrum, um, of course, there is what is now being presented through the entity that refers to itself as the Islamic State. Um, and I don't think we should in any way, shape, or form minimize the significance of their impact. If anyone has looked at and I don't necessarily encourage you to, but I just, we should not be naive to the sophistication with which this entity is communicating. It makes you almost feel nostalgic for September 12, 2001, right? When although very difficult for the Muslims here and across the West, the narratives of Islam being separated from the acts of 19 uh, individuals who are interpreting the faith in a particular way, that moment is very different from the moment that we're currently in. And let's be very honest and real about that. ISIS is responding in real time on Twitter feeds, on Facebook. They are deploying some of the most well-sophisticated, crafted, evocative, emotive, inspiring even, sets of videos, deploying Quranic hadith, Quran, ayat, hadith, sirah, images, Images that don't come out of a vacuum. Images that resonate very deeply with a particular type of sociology that they know is present in the Muslim world. In other words, the images that many of you who are here, Muslims, that have gone any Sunday school were reared on in Sunday school, right? They are masterfully co-opting, appropriating, deploying that imagery. And masterfully deploying notions of what it means to sacrifice feasibility that. And so as we think about the modern quandary, uh, I've been in conversations over the last couple of weeks who, you know, with some individuals who are, I think are very well intentioned, but clearly are not really aligned with or have not seen some of the stuff who feel like this could be simply debunked with a reference to an ayah or two. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's happening. And I know there's 
millions of dollars being invested in this counter radicalization, counter violent, and countering violent extremism, and I don't think that's an easy proposition, but I think we need to take that discourse very seriously, and I'll talk about this in a second. So here is the challenge of the modern age, reclaiming our tradition from this appropriation from these two sides of this extreme, uh, and what that looks like. I want to posit three interventions um, that are not new, but I think that are important, and then I'll open it up for conversation um, and look forward, again, to a lively back and forth. Again, with these sociological framework in mind, I'd like to posit the, 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 the following three, uh, again, responses to the, to the challenge of our traditions being under siege, hijacked, appropriated, by uh, the aforementioned uh, powers, if you will. One, we must recover the transcendent, personal, and humanizing tradition of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi We must recover and deploy that in ways that are real, that speak to the experiences, this idea that لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ حُسْوَةٌ حَسْنَةٌ Right, that within the Prophet in him, in him, is an extraordinary example. So I was listening to a scholar and, and, and people like Imam Suhaib and some of, and, and other of our kind of modern Imams that I think are doing a phenomenal job attempting to go out into the world with some of this stuff. Talk about this notion that uh, that ayah, that fi Rasulullah, right, that in him is this example. The idea that. He, that in his essence, there is a transcendent essence about his model that we need to recover. There is a magnanimous tradition within the context of our beloved Prophet about mercy, about engagement, about the idea of being capable of speaking to the maladies of the modern age, speaking to the maladies that exist in the spiritual human condition that we must be able to make real, less philosophical, but more accessible to those who are in desperate need of that. So when we think about uh, the actual core of our prophetic tradition, the idea that the Prophet ﷺ states that this is at the core of his essence, right? That he was sent for this. The idea that the Prophet ﷺ was sent to refine, right? That he was sent to refine the perfection of human character. That that process of perfecting human uh, character, dealing with all the challenges, the angst, the turbulation, and the, the trials and tribulations of the modern soul in this day and age, uh, are of any period and looking to the Prophet's character and example to be able to speak to that in ways that are truly universal, unencumbered by one particular cultural filter or the other, that is the challenge of the modern age. Right? In other words, in very real terms, how, how is his story as real right, to the homeless veteran on the west side of Chicago, to the uh, recovering alcoholic, to the agnostic, you know, professor, uh, who to you know uh, the Native American Indians on reservation. How how is it as real to people at all times, at all places, whether they become Muslim or not, right? How is it that we help to recover that tradition as a human tradition, real that speaks to the utter humanity of something that has been so dehumanized? so utterly confined to parochial barbarism that his narrative, and we must be honest about this, and, and not take this as some type of kind of simple intellectual challenge. I, I, I think if we don't do this, we are soon going to find our kids telling us we can no longer relate to that tradition. It's either we relate to it in a context that suggests that we become part of a pathological death cult, right? In Balad al-Sham. Or we subject ourselves 
to a tyrannical interpretation of his tradition that doesn't speak to our own spiritual maladies. And, and by this, let me give you some real practical examples. And this means that we need to be creatively, creatively deployed in this, in this work. Deepak Chotra, who's read his text on the Prophet One person. The scholar. Now, I remember when he came out with his text. There were some Muslims that were just like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Like, I'm going to read a sirah? from Deepak Chotra on the Prophet's son's life. Right? And we need to just confront, let, let's just be, let's call it like it is. Let's confront some of the hubris that exists in our community and, and, and hubris coupled with arrogance, right? So we're not deploying other creative interventions, yet the creative interventions that are out there attempts to actually humanize his narrative. Now, he writes, if you read the text, interesting thing, here's a public intellectual that has more access to conversations that happen across the country than many other scholars, irrespective of how, how you think of them. And he writes a text on his life. In his intro, does he, Dr. Cloud, he clearly states, this is not a sirah. This is not a biography. This is a novel of sorts. And he does something that, of course, I understand that we makes Muslims feel a little com uncomfortable. He writes in the first person of Bilal, Khadija, various people around the love life of the Prophet. Now, amazingly, even though he writes in the first person, provides us with a disclaimer, hey Muslims, I know you take this very sensitively. Don't don't burn down my house. Don't come, you know, don't be protesting in front of my kids' school, something you haven't read, right? This is not a sira. Just hold on, right? So although he gives us all those disclaimers. He then goes on, actually, to humanize these stories in profoundly remarkable ways that are actually consistent with, most, mostly consistent, mostly consistent with traditional accounts of the stories. Literally, citing, if you go and cite those traditional initial, you know, life biographies of the Prophet Center that get inserted into Rahid al-Maktoum and the more traditional Martin Ling's biographies of his, prophet, of his life, he's more or less drawing from those to provide us with a humanizing narrative. Now, whether that works for you or not, right? let's find other creative ways that are accessible. I want to throw out another controversial illustration of this. Once at the United Community Cafe, um, we had a group um, that some of you guys see, Ahlam Saeed here from Nepal, who helped introduce, Ahlam in fact introduced me to Maymuna. Some of you may know Maymuna from the roots. And she was part of a group with her mother and her grandmother called Three Generations, right? And this was a group, this was African American, uh, what was the tribe? Was it Cherokee? Wakata. Chakata, right? Chakata, Chakata. Native American women, right? Of course, both seeped in the Choctaw tradition and the African American tradition. And they got up on a stage at community cafe, mother, child, and you know someone representing the voice of their the deceased grandmother. And they did a rendition of Tala Bedra right? Now, for some Muslims, that is problematic still. Right? Now, what I suggested to some in the crowd who were hearing women sing about the life of the Prophet who had problems with women singing the aura. I mean, again, I'm not disparaging, dismissing, minimizing the importance of those tricky conversations. But in the context of the larger conversation about Sira, here you had, probably, I think for many of us, one of those most moving renditions of an age-old song, of a 1,400-year-old love ballad to our beloved Prophet being sung by African-American Native women, right? One of which wasn't even Muslim singing that song with such fervent love and reverence, right? What does that do to translate in a day and age where he's, his life and story is being minimized, dehumanized, debated? What does that do to someone like my young daughter who was in the audience at the time, who for the first time is hearing women valorize and, and provide this 
beautiful rendition. So whether it is those types of interventions, whether it is different biographies, whether it's ways in which we model through uh, recovering, retrieving, repackaging for not only the non-Muslims, but quite frankly for so many of the Muslims. You know, we don't live in hermetically sealed off worlds. Uh, the assault on his life, if you've watched, uh, and I believe they're called the Hayat media, right? The media wing of ISIL. I mean, even I think firmly entrenched Muslims can be affected by some of this stuff. If you see some of the barbarism that's happening, it does a number. It does a number on our hearts. And we ask Allah to make our hearts firm. But it does a number. So whether we need to consider those types of interventions in his life story, a repackaging, a reintroduction, as relevant and as necessary for the Muslims as it is for those detractors among them and those who are reliant on the detractors for their 30-second soundbite about Islam. Second intervention. For me, and I'll say this just kind of in shorthand, taking Dr. J, Dr. Sherman Jackson seriously. Right? Take, taking, his thesis, taking his thesis seriously. Right? Taking, the, taking the scholarly work of the Dr. Alan McClouds, the Dr. Sherman Jacksons, taking their scholarship seriously. You know, we, I remember Dr. Jackson's book, right? It was the idea, it precipitated, it was effective, particularly the book I'm talking about now, Islam and the Black American Towards the Third Resurrection. Right? It was effective in precipitating the debate, but it was also, many people responded again, very negatively to some of the uh, implications of the text without necessarily reading the text. Uh, uh, unfortunately, not an unfamiliar tendency, right, in our community with some of the work that is attempting to get to agitate us, to, to get us to think differently about issues. Dr. Jackson's thesis, and I, and I hope to do it justice in a very nutshell version, the idea that post-1965, at least part of his argument in that text, that post-1965 immigration to America with a new emerging hegemonic authority narrative frame, Zarina Grewal talks about them as moral authorities, right, a student of Dr. Jackson, these overarching narratives become operative, dominant, and silencing in some very destructive ways that deroot, disinherit, an emerging, indigenously rooted Islamic tradition in America. Now, that's a mouthful, and there's implications, and you know, we you can challenge Dr. Jackson, and many of us have on some of the dichotomies between immigrant and indigenous, that's all fine and well. But the idea that that phenomena happened, and why does that implication, what does that have in the context of who we are and what we are right now? I'll give you some very practical examples. Now, interestingly, recently I spoke at a, a college, and I'll say it, and because, and I don't mean, and what I'm going to say is not to in any way, shape, or form uh, minimize the significance of these students at the college, just at Loyola, the MSA there. Some Loyola students, raise your hands. Okay, I love you, right? You're great students, you're doing great work on your campus. But you remember in that talk, at one point, I asked, and it was a pretty, big room, right? What was it? 300? 300, 300 or so? At one point, I asked in the room how many people had heard of or know of Imam Warthi Muhammad. Remember that? And and I'm not exaggerating, maybe seven to eight hands went up. Right? Now, I don't, I'm not, I'm not a self-professed student of Imam Muhammad. I was one of his, may Allah have mercy on him, a beneficiary of his, like all of us in this room. But I say this to say this point, right? And that here you have perhaps one of the most consequential American Muslim voices of the 20th century precipitates the largest embrace of Sunni or universal Islam at any point in our history, and perhaps rivaling any other point in global 20th century history across the Muslim world. 
lays a framework for an engagement with the larger American society, leads the first Salat here in McCormick Place in 1975. First one to take a large migration of people to Hajj, right? You know, this is, of course, after Malcolm, but, you know, um, extraordinary human life, right? That reframes and, under and attempts to package an Islam that is accessible. Throughout his life, and even afterwards, and even in death, while there was, and I would suggest, and I'd be harsh a little bit here, while there was a cursory deference paid to him, I don't think there was ever an appreciation for him. And I still would suggest there's not. The, and, and whether you agree with him on this or that, that's not the point. The fact that he was embarking on a profound project to make Islam relevant, to make it contextually accessible, the fact that his version of referencing the Prophet Sallallahu looked different than the man sitting in the corner wearing a thobe and slippers and had all the moral authority and cultural resonance of another more hegemonic narrative was in and of itself enough to discredit him. And there are consequences for that, for all of us. I, I remember once I, I was speaking to him maybe a week before his passing. He told me honestly, and, and we had this interesting exchange because I've been in you know, debates with people who are debating him, both within the African American community and other communities. One thing he said, and he said this to me as clear as night, the difference between night and day. He said, listen, Rami, you know, irrespective of the debates, wallahi, my whole life was about pointing them, in other words, his community, to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa his whole life devoted to that project. Yet when, when Imam Muhammad Rahim Allah, spoke, he didn't always deploy all the ahadith in Arabic, right? He didn't deploy, he, he deployed terminology that spoke to the multiplicities of the existence with the communities in him, some of whom were still coming from the nation, some of whom dealing with a whole bunch of realities. My point being, and there are students here, our beloved Imam and others that are here, certainly that can give you a much more rich, lived experience of what it means to be raised in that community. My point for us is there are consequences for minimizing projects that have attempted to contextually make relevant a different way of relating to the Prophet ﷺ. And part of those consequences we're reaping today when our young people are being reared with the only connection to him, to the prophetic tradition, is often through filters. Either it's going to come through filters that are often very exclusive or filters that look more like what's happening in Raqqa, Syria, than it's going to ever be with an Imam Muhammad or those who look like him. When I mention the name Kenny Gamble, to people, look, man, Abdul Haq, right? We take a we take a, a brother that that's deceased. Now, Iman, some of you may know, three four years ago, we brought him to be our keynote speaker. Relatively unheard of by the Muslim community. Amazingly, right? One of the only now put aside his cultural status. I mean, his cultural status. Gamble and Huff produced more gold and silver records than perhaps any recording duo in American history, right? He's the first. Uh, the first or second American Muslim to be inducted in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. More significantly, here's a man that devoted his entire life to going back to South Philly, a drug-infested, crack-riddled, you know, prostitute-riddled street that he grew up in, reinvest in buying a, a, a stretch of row homes, and begins a urban renewal project that, quite frankly, across the country is perhaps one of the most amazing urban renewal projects, not only held up by small sectors of the Muslim community who refer to Kenny Gamble, but to a number of people across the country who've looked at him. Even so, when the Republicans had their convention in Philly, they asked Kenny to be one of the keynote speakers. Imam Luqman Abdul Haq never appears publicly without a kufi on his head, has never disconnected himself from identifying publicly as a Muslim, yet he is in many circles a, a virtually unrecognizable name. Yet he's perhaps one of the most significant, consequential American Muslims shaping reality in our, in our time and place. We have to ask ourselves seriously, what about our filters of sirah or sunnah don't praise the type of significance or legitimacy on individuals? Like him, like Taiba Taylor, may Allah mercy on her, like Aisha Mustafa. I mean, these are just, just a set of names, right? Extraordinary names 
who have been committed to living the life, the living prophetic life in our time and age that are not part of our repertoire when we reference them. And I think by not having them in our repertoire, we make ourselves more vulnerable for this contention that sunnah, sirah, must look a particular way. So that although those who have helped us, and may Allah you know, make projects like Zaytuna continuously successful, and may Allah reward the scholars, who, people like Sheikh Hamza, who've had a profound influence on so many of us in this room, myself first and foremost, to even encouraging us to re-engage the tradition of Islam. But there are consequences for simply either buying into a framework that suggests that if it's not a tradition packaged in that framing, or packaged in a framing that looks resonant with what Islam looks across the world, there are implications for us. And if we don't lift up projects locally with a level of seriousness and take Dr. Jackson's assertion in uh, Islam and the black American towards the third resurrection seriously, I think we will continue to find ourselves vulnerable the types of situations that we confronted in that I, and will continue to confront with young Muslims who are brought up in our midst that are migrating to other parts of the world to be parts of movements. Now I'm not saying that, you know, that's a heavy causal link and I'm not suggesting it is uncomplicated, but I am putting it out there. I do posit that there is a causal link between uh, this identification and if you will, this you know, notion to com consolidate, if you will, um, the notion of Islam and affix it to a particular form. Lastly, I'll say this as an intervention and then open this up, is, and I think this perhaps is the most blaringly obvious but worth stating um, in terms of reclaiming this tradition, is just all of us continue to be inspired and very linked to the previous sets of examples why do I think it's important to lift up people like Imam Muhammad, may Allah have mercy on him? Why do I think it's important to people like, you know, Aisha Mustafa, Mansoor, Sabri in Atlanta, and these names that some, you know, all these extraordinary people, because we need to continue to be inspired of the relevance of Islam in our day and age and shaping the realities around us, and to strive to be that prophetic light. You know, um, I think that set of intervention, that action in the world is clearly what has tried, driven so many of us at Iman to do the, the work that we're trying to do. Uh, but that work is impossible without all the examples that informed it. It's impossible. I wouldn't have ever thought of a fraction of what I ever we thought about Iman without being honored and esteemed to be included in the very periphery of a conversation by people like Imam Talib and others that brought us across the country when entities like Manor were forming to sit with people like Kenny Gamble, to go to Baltimore, to sit with people like Safir Rub, to see these extraordinary examples, many examples that don't get the type of acknowledgement that even Iman has been fortunate enough to receive in the, in the last several years. So we must acknowledge them as not just examples of something that are nice, but really models that are aspiring to reflect that prophetic light, right? That light, that sirah, that, that, that aspect of the sirah that is that universal transcendent, you know, force that we are all striving to make sure that we remain connected to. You know, you know we talk about this in light of the Prophet Sallallahu hadith, yeah, uh, his, his dua, this idea that he would stay up in the middle of the night, beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make him a light, right? To make him a light, even though he was already distinguished as this extraordinary reflection of the light of the sun, the kamar, he was this light of the moon, but he would stay up and, and make that dua in the middle of the night, Allahumma jayfi fi qalbi mura wa yamini mura, wa nisari mura wa fawki mura, tahti mura, amami mura wa khalfi mura, Allahumma jahani mura. May Allah, we all know this dua, oh, may Allah, you know, put in my heart your light, make it, make it on the right of me, your light on the left of me, light on top, on top of me, light behind and below me, light in front of me, your light behind me, light, oh Allah, make me your light, right? He had this himma, the Prophet ﷺ had this aspiration to be a universal light, right? To lighten the people's not only, you know, uh, afflictions that they were facing, but with what they can be, a better version of themselves. You know, there is uh, an Iman uh, on the side of our wall. I think about this, uh, this idea of light being an ability to allow you to see yourself differently. Right? The Prophet said, allow people to see themselves differently. So much of the Sita was about lifting people up. 
right? <laughs> lifting the Bilal al-Habashi, the Sahib al-Rumi, the Salman al-Farsi, lifting the unnamed woman who cleaned the mosque, lifting them up, esteeming them, valorizing them, right? Letting them see in themselves something that had been robbed from them by some social variable or the other. So, you know, I, I think about that in the context of a, a, you know, we have on the side of our wall, some of you may have seen this when we, when Iman opened up its center, we had this wall that kind of faced incoming traffic going westbound on 63rd and said it's a great idea to do a mural. So we worked with Chicago Public Arts Project and we brought this great Latino muralist to work and some graph writers, some really famous graph writers. And part of what we did, uh, this Latino uh, muralist who's kind of, you know, has uh, a lot of, uh, he, he's renowned across the world for making some really phenomenal meals. He asked us to gather all the neighbors around the center. So he gathered all the neighbors. Then he said, go get something valuable from your home for us that you're willing to donate to this wall, ceramic of some sort. So then they all came back the next day with, you know, vases, ceramic plates, things that their great grandmothers had given them. The Arabi women came back with these plates from you know, Philistine, you know, you know the, the famous stuff that you get from Nablus or Uds, right? Everyone came back with something. Then he asked them to do something that kind of, you know, it was a little shock. He asked them to throw it on the floor, smash it. So they, you know, reluctantly, and, and many of them ended up doing so. And then over the period of the next two, three weeks, started working with the young people to get the, the broken pieces of everything that people had gathered and to assemble this extraordinary mural on the side of a wall. In the middle of it is a ayah from Surah al Rahman. Is there reward for good other than just good? And in the, uh, on the wall, a placement of mirrors, right? And we wanted something that said, look, we wanted to reflect something in the neighborhood. So he took the Catholic church across the street from us took some of the mosaics that were on the church and wove it into some of the kind of ornaments that were on the wall, along with the attribute of Ar-Rahman that was made out of the cer ceramics, right, that, that people gathered. Now, so you have this wall now. He called it Good Reflections. You have this wall and you have this mirror here, and you have a number of mirrors. Now at night, um, over the years, it's interesting because over the years I've seen a whole bunch of people, you know, like burning the light, burning the candle at the other end, so to speak, on both ends, Eddie Man. Oftentimes I'm in this one part, I'm parked kind of conspicuously in the back, and so no one kind of doesn't see a car occasionally at 1 a.m., and I'm working in a part of Eman that allows me to see people as they're walking and into the parking lot. And I always used to see this woman around 12 o'clock, 1 in the morning. And, you know, in our part of the neighborhood, part of the challenge is, you know, for a lot of low-income and abused women is the story of prostitution, right? It's not the high-end escorts. These are people who are really at, who have been abused over and over and over and now find themselves with no refuge but the street. There's this elderly prostitute woman who's probably, I'd say, you know, 60s, who I would always see fixing herself up in the mirror. And one day, I was driving out, and I, my car was coming out. This was not too long ago. And I didn't mean to shock her, but I caught her in the mirror. And I rolled down my window, and she turned around. She looked at me, she smiled. She knew I was from the center. They had been to the clinic. And she said, you know, sorry, baby. I, I just love this mirror. This is my mirror, right? There's something about this mirror. I feel good about myself looking in this mirror. You know? And I said, you know, sister, that's your mirror. And you look beautiful. And I, and I think about our prophet self -centered. You know, he made people feel beautiful. People who were denigrated, people who were objectified. And that's, that's part of our tradition. And, you know, that is part of the human experience. And we need to recover that beyond just the words, the framing, but even in the spite of everything that we're dealing with in our direct actions, you know, 
And there's such extraordinary opportunity to do that with so many people who are suffering across the world. When they encounter that, when they encounter that in you, the conversation about who he is is just completely irrelevant. The, question, the conversation about what people say he is is irrelevant because they will see through you what you are aspiring to represent through our work, through our collective commitment to living that ideal, to living that value. And if that becomes more accessible, intelligible, and if that becomes more real for people, then both for our young people, both for Muslims and non-Muslims, it will be, you know, the, the batr and the haq, the truth and the falsehood will be clear. You cannot look at what is being presented as Islam, both by the most sophisticated, you know, copy editing and sophisticated digital mastery, high definition videos being produced at ISIS, or by the most compelling, overwhelming narratives being produced on the other side, and be tricked that this has anything to do with the essence of the most merciful, the most beautiful, the most inspiring, life-affirming model that we believe has ever walked the face of the earth.